Good afternoon. I'm really delighted to be here uh, to have the opportunity to say a few words about global energy assessment. I would also like to thank Ch Chatham House for holding this, uh, hosting this event. Um, uh, let me just say that the JET has asked me to talk for 15 minutes. Clearly, in 15 minutes, I cannot do justice to this humongous piece of work. That, uh, so I can only give you a very brief introduction. Uh, global energy assessment is about the grand transformation uh, toward a sustainable future. And the picture that you see behind the title is the picture of YASA. Um, residents in Austria that hosted the global energy assessment, but as Pavel mentioned in his introductory comments, it was a community effort. I would actually even argue that it has been a community building effort. Um, at least for me, it started about five years ago. Um, at least for me, I think one of the major reasons why it was important to undertake such an assessment, and the assessment in this context is modeled after IPCC, involving many, many authors and many reviewers from all over the world. Uh, the major reason for that is that the current trends are definitely not sustainable. Uh, in the age of Anthropocene, we are hitting planetary boundaries in many, many areas, and energy is the key for that. And let me highlight in the first bullet what I personally think, and that comes out on, in, in global energy assessment is an important challenge, which is that from 7 billion people, three still have to cook with solid fuels, leading to many health problems, in particular for women and children. And half, uh, half uh, about one and a half billion, do not, have lack, uh, do, do not have access to electricity. This is a major barrier to development in general. So energy is the key for development, and in global energy assessment, we try to understand uh, the criteria of how a more sustainable future would look like, look like um, not just from the point of view of access, that being a very important entry point, but also eliminating air pollution, um, achieving the climate goals, worrying about the water sustainability, food, land use, and many, many other things. And one of the major conclusions is that uh, energy efficiency and decarbonization would bring multiple benefits toward achieving that goal uh, and many, many others in particular health, security, and climate change. But the, the requ financing requirements are huge, and I will, I will close with that, um, but perhaps one can call them aspirational, but I think it yeah, indicates that it's doable to provide the financing, and I'll be also interested to see what me, uh, Michael says afterwards. So this is the report you have seen. Uh, a big book, I want to show it again, 2,000 pages published by Cambridge University Press, but it can be downloaded from the website you see there, single chapters or the whole volume. Pavel already mentioned 300 authors have participated, 43 of those come from this country, which I think is quite impressive. Uh, we had 200 reviewers as well, and I looked at the per list of participants, and I've seen that about 14 authors are actually here among us, so I cannot mention everybody by name. Some will be on the panel, but the great appreciation goes to the community that has done this work. Um, let me just mention two or three statistics. 650 figures for those of you who teach. That's, a, I think, a great asset. Um, but also 7,000 references of up-to-date literature. So I think from that point of view, it's a monumental report. But we did produce also the summary that are available here. Um, there is a three-page, just 10 key messages from it, a three-page document, and there is a policymaker summary of 30 pages and a technical summary of about 60 pages that I think gives more justice to the whole volume. So let me start with, um, with an issue of access, and I think GEA has made a fundamental contribution to understanding the challenges of access and the way forward. Uh, this map, if you look at it, um, I think it's relatively easy to understand, but it's place specific. It looks, it, we really looked at where are the people who do not have access. The color code is if you go from green to red, the number of people without access to electricity increases. If you go from lighter to darker color, the number of people who have to cook with solid fuels increases. And I've mentioned the numbers, but if you look at the Sub-Saharan Africa, we have about uh, 750 
million people living in the rural um, sub-Saharan Africa who do not have access to electricity, only sporadic, and they usually pay higher electricity prices than we do. It's not just the health impacts. Uh, and if you look at the northern parts of the Indian subcontinent, it's quite red. It means also no access to electricity. So that's the main challenge, how to do that. And Gea makes a big leap forward to showing how it could be done. This is a historical analysis of how countries that do have universal access to electricity have done that. US, Europe, Soviet Union were good examples. In 30 to 40 years, we went from only partial access to 100%, everybody having access. And some of the rapidly developing countries like Brazil, China, are good examples today. In just over 20 years, it was done. And what's significant, it was done at significantly lower uh, per capita income. And so that's, that's an important threshold because of the new technologies and systems. So the hope is that in India, South Africa, with the right policies, we can achieve that within two decades, by 2030. That was the normative goal of the Global Energy Assessment. And the mixture of policies is proposed how to achieve that in different parts of the world, ranging from microcredits to subsidies. But I think one broader conclusion that's important is that this should be a part of the wider development agenda because then uh, universal access can be achieved faster. There is an institutional and financing stability. And of course, it would benefit development much more. Another question one might then ask against this backdrop is do we have enough energy for that? And one of our goals in the global energy assessment was to stabilize climate at less than two degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level. So I'm showing you some numbers in terms of CO2 emissions. The current content of the atmosphere of carbon is 3,000 billion tons, gigatons. Uh, we have added 1,000. Uh, because we have emitted twice that much over the period of industrialization, half has stayed in the atmosphere. And the key is that about 850 is our future endowment. 850 billion tons can be emitted in the future if we want to stay below 2 degrees, and that has to be used widely. Gaia has made a major assessment of energy resources. This is how much carbon is in oil reserves, up to 1,000. A billion tons, gas about 500, um, biomass above ground about one and a half thousand, coincidentally a similar number. Uh, if that is used with CCS, then one could achieve negative emissions, removing carbon from the atmosphere. These are all, uh, uh, tar sands, that's not a nice energy, an easy energy source, and gas shales. They are huge, and this is a big debate we are having about what role they will be playing in the transformation. Uncertainty is also large. Compared to that, the coal, so the temptation of doing business as usual and staying at, uh, with coal is large, and these are the gas hydrates that might be as large as everything else together. So the conclusion of GAIA is that the transformation needs to be based on a vision of the future, a transformation towards sustainable development. The other option we have is, of course, the renewable sunlight alone is 10,000 times larger than the total global energy demand in the, in the world. So the options are there. But the transformation has lots of intricacies. Let me show you this finding of Gaia, which I think is, gives you another insight. This is Europe. Energy density, all of the areas that are blue or white are the areas where one can generate from no local energy flows, such as wind and sunlight, more energy than it would be required locally. So you need smart grids, off-grids uh, uh, solutions there. All of the areas that are red and, and orange need large infrastructure. So we need to do both. We need smart systems and we need larger systems. But renewables also offer a huge option for resolving the, uh, the, um, the energy challenges. In Europe today, up to 20 to 30 percent can be produced locally. But in Asia, we might need large infrastructures. This is the super grid idea uh, to connect uh, large energy markets, uh, urban areas that might be exceeding 100 million. We have already 50% of the people in the world live in the cities. That will probably double over the time frame of global energy assessment. So let me just show you how some of these transformations might look like. Here you can see the historical development of energy, about 2% growth per year in energy demand, uh, and about 80% of that is today fossil. Here is one of the pathways into the future. 
and global energy assessment has developed 60, 40 of which can reach the sustainable future in 20 to 30 years from now and maintain it over the rest of the century. Um, what you see here is that efficiency plays a really crucial role, and I think that's related to the UK energy bill. Efficiency is the key policy measure, about 40% of the energy reduction is due to the efficiency by over 20, next 20 years. Renewable shares are about 35%, so doubling the, the current share in the world. Um, in this particular case, it's a very difficult one. There is no CCS, and nuclear is even phased out slowly. as a sensitivity analysis, and an important finding is that we cannot foropt more than one or two options. We need a portfolio. Uh, in this case, also oil peaks. Um, here is another scenario, I'll just show you two, as you can see in this one, nuclear does make a major contribution and that will be also different from region to region. Efficiency is still important, there is more gas because gas is a kind of a virtual storage for renewables, for intermittent renewables. In this scenario also CCS plays quite an important role, also in conjunction with biomass to achieve negative emissions, but also removing carbon from gas and coal is an important option here. So let me just show you the European context within this particular scenario. No increase in energy demand. So efficiency is really important and you can see the structure here changes even more rapidly, which is of course important that Europe maintains a leading role. Um, how could that be done? And this is another important uh, achievement of GEA, Global Energy Assessment. Um, we need to improve the technologies, and this is, has been documented in the, the global energy assessment. These are so-called experience curves. What you see on the vertical scale is the cost per kilowatt installed capacity of many of the technologies. So let me just show you this red line. This is the cost of declining cost of the photovoltaics, and at the bottom, the green curve is the declining cost of, of Brazilian ethanol. It's about 30% reduction in cost per doubling of the global capacity. So it's quite impressive, but not all of the technologies go down. If you see these things that are ramping up, that's nuclear in France and in US, and I think we know some of the reasons why the costs have been escalating, but even offshore wind, it's in the middle of this maze, is quite relatively flat. So we need large investments to achieve in many of these technologies this kind of improvements. Otherwise, the transformation will not work. Um, so let me then just conclude. Um, this is my penultimate slide. Let me just say, a um, few words about the investments. Um, on the, and I'm just showing you efficiency and renewable investment requirements, the ones for access, because that's so important, and then the total investment. The R&D situation today in the world is about just over 50 billion, including public and private R&D in energy. And it's increasing at a slower rate than the total R&D. But as you can see, less than a billion goes to access. The renewables are being ramped up. Early market formation to improve the technologies is about three times that much. Still almost nothing going to access. And today's investments, total investments in the energy are about 1.3 billion, a trillion worldwide. Only nine going to access. Uh, and on the right is what we would need for those kind of more sustainable pathways, with at least 40. Uh, 40 billion for access and about 400 and 400 for efficiency. So an increase of about 50%. There is also some good news, 50% to 100% increase in investment. The good news is that we spent that difference essentially on energy subsidies today in the world. And they are blocking the transformation to a large extent. So, so it's a question actually of institutional arrangements. How can we make, make sure that these high capital and upfront investments are done that have long-term benefits? And let me just show you at the end the long-term benefits um, that's derived from the findings of GEA by our colleagues. Um, these are three, three goals that we try to achieve in GEA. One of them is to achieve energy security. That would cost us roughly, uncertainty is big, let's say 0.2% of the total global GN, uh, GDP, which is about 70 trillion today. Air pollution would be about 0.6. So putting that together, we are about 0.8. Climate change, stabilizing at two degrees, might cost on the order of one. So altogether is about one and a half uh, plus percent. 
If we do all of that together, which is the basic premise of, of GAIA, integrated assessment, then the marginal cost of achieving all of the goals are just a little bit above just doing climate alone. So it shows that energy is an important entry point and that we need new policies, and that's one of the reasons why we did this in one volume and not in four or five or six volumes to symbolically show that an integrated approach is necessary. And let me just conclude by saying that um, some of these goals, and maybe, maybe you will refer to that, have informed the Sustainable Energy for All initiative of Ban Ki-moon that I think is ga gaining incredible momentum around the world. About 60 countries have now action plans to achieve some of these goals that we've been talking about. Universal access in 20 years, uh, doubling the rate of energy efficiency improvement and doubling the share of renewables. So I'm great hopes that this can be actually done and um, look forward to your interventions and comments. Thank you very much.